Good evening. I'm Molly Duffy, and I'm the executive director of the Valley Forge Park Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the third event in our 2021 speaker series, sponsored by the Sharon H. and Bruce A. Bakke Foundation. It's so nice to be with you tonight. I saw the attendance list and I know so many of you and it would be so much nicer to see you in person, but I'm glad that we can at least do this. So I'd like to just start with some housekeeping. Since we have several presenters tonight and panelists this evening, I recommend that you put your Zoom session in speaker view. There's an icon in the upper right portion of your Zoom screen that should allow you to toggle between speaker view and gallery view. Speaker view is less distracting as it allows you to see only who's currently presenting. There's also a Q&A chat during our Zoom webinar tonight, and it can be used for you to submit questions. The Q&A chat icon is on the bottom portion of your Zoom window. So feel free to use the Q&A chat anytime during the event for substantive and technical questions. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening. Robert D. Hicks, PhD, is Senior Consulting Scholar and William Mall Mazie Chair for the History of Medicine of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. For over a decade, he served as Director of the Mutter Museum and Historical Medical Library at the college. He holds a doctorate in history from the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom and degrees in anthropology and archeology span from the University of Arizona. His most recent book, Civil War Medicine, A Surgeon's Experience, appeared in 2019 by Indiana University Press. Welcome, Robert. Okay. Robert, is PowerPoint? I, oh, good. <laughs> okay. Is PowerPoint on the screen. Yes. Okay. We can hear you. All right. Here we go. Uh, what is smallpox vaccine? Which turns out to be a very important question, and uh, I think will be also relevant to the presentation based on Dr. Finn's book. Now, <clears throat> I have to. Pardon me for just a moment while I advance this. There we go. Yes, I represent the Mütter Museum. And uh, if you have not been there, shame on you, but there's still a chance, but you have to wait a little bit for COVID to pass by. And when it does open on January 1 again, uh, I hope you will come down and see this exhibit. If you don't get your fill of disease on a mass scale from smallpox, there's always the flu. And of course there's COVID outside. So you'll always be comfortable. Now, I know Edward Jenner is going to come up in our presentation, but I want to ask a specific question here and lead you to some fascinating research that is literally cutting edge at this moment uh, based at the Mütter Museum. Now, Edward Jenner, of course, is the fellow who uh, gets the credit for that acute observation that milkmaids milking cows with these kinds of sores on the udders, who later got the sores themselves, somehow emerged to be immune from smallpox. And of course, he called this disease cowpox. Uh, also called vaccinia, uh, what I call vac uh, smallpox light. Now I've raised this question here, is it cowpox? Is it horsepox? Is it vaccinia or what? Jenner is quite clear that the reservoir for this disease, this mild disease called smallpox, the milder version of smallpox, I should say, cowpox, resided in cows. But from the scientific side, cows are not a natural reservoir of cowpox. There's horsepox, but horses are not the natural reservoir of that. So what disease was Jenner actually observing and the vaccine he made really consisted of what? It's fascinating that nobody knows. Uh, there are no vaccine samples from the 18th or 19th century that ever have been examined in a laboratory to determine exactly what they are. 
Now, we've got to get our terms straight here, and I think this will lead into Dr. Fenn's presentation. Variola is a very common name in the early literature for smallpox. You see an illustration of somebody suffering through this, and of course, the major manifestation are these uh, physical manifestation are these pustules, which uh, can exude a fluid called lymph. And if that is not done, eventually those scabs, if you survive, will dry up and turn into scabs and fall off. Um, the inoculation refers to applying some of this material, either the lymph or some scab material, into a healthy person to give them a presumably a milder form of the disease after which they will be immune from the main target, which is smallpox. Inoculation could also refer to using material, not from people, but from cows. Now vaccination, of course, uh, is specific to Jenner's uh, observation, his innovation with cowpox. And again, I'm questioning that um, and we'll call it vaccinia from this point on. Vaccinia is a very strange term because it refers to a disease that we don't actually know anything about other than it induces smallpox-like symptoms and the application of smallpox material, or at least rather material from a person who's also had vaccinia uh, can give you essentially the vaccination. These distinctions are where this stuff comes from. Does it come from a cow? Was it from the mild disease? Does it come from a smallpox infected person? It's called something else. Now today we call this whole spectrum of pox related viruses orthopox virus, and there's a considerable spectrum of them. And we can presume that over historic time, this variation has also existed. So it makes it difficult when looking at literature of early doctors to determine exactly what they might be talking about. They may use the term smallpox when they mean vaccinia, vaccinia when they mean smallpox, or could it be another pox virus with another name. Now, I've highlighted vaccinia here because this is the object of the mystery. What is it? How did we get it? Um, how has it evolved over time? And has it a genetic influence on vaccines that have been used in the 20th century? Well, one day at the Mütter Museum, I was showing an employee some phlebotomy tools and mixed in with those bloodletting tools were five kits vaccination kits. I've been doing research on this, so I recognize what they were. The vaccination kit consisted, this is a Civil War era kit. It's a leather kit, very small, has two of these sharp lancets for obviously piercing the skin. A large recess uh, held two glass plates. This would allow you to take lymph from those sores, mix with water on one of the plates, the other plate on top to kind of mash it around a little bit, and then you could anoint the tips of the lancets and then vaccinate somebody. But there's also a little tin box just off to the right designed to be pulled out. And you see the tin box down below, bottom of the screen. Well, I opened a tin box and what did I find? This is scab material. This is material from somebody who had vaccinia, possibly smallpox, and this material was to be used for making vaccines. Well, nobody necessarily cleans medical tools when they go into a collection. And Maybe it's a good thing that it was not possible to uh, sterilize instruments in those early days. Otherwise, we wouldn't get the information that I'm about to give you. So when I discovered this, uh, some phone calls had to be made in a hurry because I didn't want to be the one to reawaken smallpox to the world since that is a disease that has been eliminated through vaccination. Uh, Anna Doty, the curator of the museum, also doubles as director of the Mütter Research Institute. And we saw this as an opportunity to do some research on the fundamentals. What is smallpox? What is vaccine and where did it come from? That's Anna seated at the table with a uh, public health official standing by to receive those kits and convey them to the Centers for Disease Control. The CDC has never actually handled a sample of a human disease that dates before 1940. So this was of some interest but their technology only allowed them to go so far as to say, this is smallpox related material, but it seems to be an unknown pox virus indicated with these scabs. So we went on to the next stage with our collaborators. We had to go through the World Health Organization to get these kits into Canada to our friends here at McMaster uh, University. They have the ability to do non-destructive testing to elicit uh, viable DNA from the most forbidding of things. And uh, the first time anybody ever recovered DNA from a pickled 
anatomical specimen in a museum was at the Mütter Museum a few years ago, and they did it with cholera, and that's another story. Well, this is cutting edge. As you see from the upper left here, this genome biology paper is our first big paper, uh, and it was just last July that it came out. It's already drawn considerable press attention and within the scientific press. And the article you see at lower right uh, is, I think, being emailed to every participant. Uh, embedded in there is a link to the genome biology article if you should want to read it. Now, what you need to know about this is uh, these kits yielded genomes. They were difficult to reconstruct. Fortunately, none of this was infectious material, could have been. Nobody knows for sure how long this stuff can remain on a, on a kit or on an instrument. But uh, all of these were sequenced, and three of them turned out to come from women of European ancestry in the Philadelphia area. Now, none of these kits were owned by the same person, but they were all owned by Philadelphia doctors. So there's a Philadelphia connection there. Also, uh, the version of Vaccinia that was uh, teased out of this analysis is unlike any form that is recognizable in the 20th century. And, and at least sometime in the 20th century, whatever was being used for vaccine was not related to this. So this is somewhere on that spectrum of orthopox viruses, and we're going to have to look further to see exactly where this is. It's close enough to the target disease, smallpox, to have been probably effective as a vaccine, but we still do not know what it is. And it heightens the mystery about what is a vaccinia, where did it come from, how did it evolve to its use as a vaccine in the 19th and into the 20th centuries. So this is pretty hot stuff. And I should say the work is ongoing. We are now working with assaying tools that are in other museum collections. And I will say, we're also including some tools owned and used by Dr. Jenner himself. So watch this space. So here we have a convergence of science with history. And we do have some questions that, uh, some of which are immediately relevant to the research going on with COVID. Just as you get a flu shot every year, and uh, the strain of flu that's used in that vaccine is estimated to be the strain of flu that's going to be most active during that particular flu season. It may not be, but probably will be. But flu is an upper respiratory virus. There are gazillions of variants of upper respiratory virus. And of course, COVID is one of them. So part of the interest here is how far apart can you get from the target disease on a spectrum of like diseases and still get an effective vaccine? So this is a relevant question in research today. And it would have been relevant in the 19th century, even in the pre-DNA days. So these are questions that we want to take going forward. Now, that's just my teaser. Uh, we need to get on with the main event, but if you should happen to be post-COVID in the UK and have an opportunity to visit Dr. Jenner's house museum, in the backyard, in his beautiful garden, there is a folly that he called the Temple of Vaccinia. And what I call is the world's first vaccination clinic. So you must stand in there and take a selfie and know that this is where Dr. Jenner started inoculating people in his own neighborhood. And among the things I discovered at that uh, house museum was that there is a Hindu goddess of smallpox. And you can see a little clay figurine, that's her. So hello to that goddess who uh, represents both the disease and the disease's cure. All right, I will stop the music here and get back to the screen. It's time to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Fenn. Uh, she has a long distinguished title. She is the Distinguished Professor of Early American and Native American History at the University of Colorado Boulder, and she also holds an endowed chair, the Walter S. and Lucien Driscoll Chair in Western American History. Now, her PhD work was at Yale, and her dissertation was turned into the book that she's talking about this evening, Pox Americana, the Great Smallpox Epidemic of 1775-82. And I must give it an endorsement. It's a wonderful book uh, in getting my own education about smallpox history in this country. I found it of immense value. Uh, she also attended Duke University for an undergraduate degree. And I have to put in there that she spent many years as an auto mechanic. So maybe you have questions about repairing your car in addition to smallpox. Uh, she continues to publish and is well recognized. She received a Pulitzer Prize in history for her 2015 book, 
uh, Encounters at the Heart of the World, A History of the Mandan People. And she has a very strong and continuing research interest in the indigenous history of the early West, particularly before the Civil War. Uh, on her website, she says that uh, she sees history, and this speaks to her own work, as, quote, an imperfect undertaking that invites constant revision, reflection, and innovation. I will add science to that, and amen to that, and let's get on with Dr. Fenn. Well, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction, Dr. Hicks. I, I have to say just by way of your closing comment there that I am busy preparing a new course on uh, global the history of global pandemics. And one of the things that I am just enthralled with is the way history and ancient DNA play so well together. It's really been fun to uh, delve into malaria and cholera and plague and all of those uh, wonderful topics uh, that uh, have become increasingly relevant in our current situation. So I'm going to pause for a minute and share my screen with everyone. Okay. Um, so the events that I'm going to describe to you today took place from 1775 to 1782, almost exactly the years of the American Revolution. But instead of plunging right into these years, I want to fast forward a little bit. And I want you to envision the great British sea captain, George Vancouver, exploring the northwest coast of America in 1792. What he saw in the region around Vancouver Island disturbed him greatly. The land was abundant. It had a seemingly unlimited supply of salmon and fresh drinking water, but there were hardly any people. And instead, Vancouver found deserted villages. The first, that, which he encountered just south of Vancouver Island, the island that bears his name today, he said was overrun with weeds, amongst which were found several human skulls and other bones promiscuously scattered about. Members of his crew made similar observations. So all of the evidence Vancouver believed indicated that, as he put it, at no very remote period, this country had been far more populous than at present. Now, the truth is that even Vancouver, even his men could not have known the scope of the problem they had stumbled upon. There had been a disaster and it was a disaster so vast that even its witnesses, even its victims could not appreciate its extent. In the years from 1775 to 1782, as the Revolutionary War reshaped society and politics along the Eastern seaboard, this very different cataclysm had shaken the entire North American continent. And that cataclysm, huge and quite hideous, was smallpox. Now, let me pause for a minute and ask each of you to contemplate whether you have a vaccination scar. Usually it's on sort of the deltoid muscle of the upper arm, sometimes you can find you, you'll, you'll find it on the uh, on the thigh. It's you know maybe a half inch to an inch diameter mottled scar. And if I could poll everybody in the audience this evening, we would find that elders have scars and younger people do not. That's because smallpox vaccination was dropped from the United States Immunization Protocol in 1972. Uh, so if you were born before 1972, you're likely to have a vaccination scar. And if you were born after 1972, odds are you don't have a scar unless you served in, in the military. Smallpox, as Dr. Hicks also uh, suggested, was um, eradicated from the world in 1977. Uh, the eradication was certified by the World Health Organization in 1979. It remains the only human disease uh, that we have successfully eradicated from the world. 
So as Dr. Hicks mentioned, smallpox is caused by a moderately contagious virus known as variola uh, or variola major is probably the virus that we are talking about in the 1700s. It's transmitted almost exclusively through human to human contact, usually you know, face to face contact with a sick person. The symptoms can vary among victims. They generally include headache, backache, fever, sometimes vomiting, malaise, followed by a painful and often hideous rash. For those patients whose rash turns inward, death follows quickly. Uh, as, as the patient bleeds from the eyes, nose, gums, and other mucous membranes. In most cases, however, the, the, the pustules push through to the skin surface. And if those pustules remain discrete, if they remain separate from one another, the prognosis is fairly good. If the pustules run together in what was called confluent smallpox, patients stand at least a 60% chance of dying. In all, the course of this disease takes roughly one month. And, and victims are contagious from the onset of symptoms until the last scab falls off. Um, and you are not contagious during the 12 day incubation period. Now, although survivors are very likely scarred as this little boy surely was, uh, and in severe cases, they can be blinded by the disease, they're also blessed because having endured smallpox once, they are now immune. They will never catch smallpox again. Now we've also already heard a little bit about uh, this man, Edward Jenner, and the story of his development of cowpox vaccination against smallpox in 1796. Um, Jenner developed this by way of an experiment that would never be approved by an IRB board today. Um, he had observed, as Dr. Hicks mentioned, that milkmaids who milked cows and were exposed to what was called uh, cowpox tended not to get smallpox. And he postulated that perhaps their exposure to cowpox gave them some kind of immunity to smallpox. So he, uh, he actually found a, an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps, um, and performed this experiment in which he vaccinated him, by which I mean he cut an incision in his hand or his arm, implanted pustular matter from cowpox into James Phipps's arm, he batted it up, he came down with a, a case of cowpox, a relatively mild disease, healed from it, and then Jenner tried to infect him with smallpox and he could not get the infection to take. That was uh, one British historian described it as, uh, as, as though an angel's trumpet had sounded around the world. Now, the key I want you to take away from this for our purposes today is that before 1796, vaccination was unknown. But 18th century Americans still had two weapons they used to fight the disease. The first was isolation also known as quarantine. We're quite familiar with that. And the second weapon was this thing called inoculation, uh, more properly referred to, I suppose, as variolation. And, you know, uh, Dr. Hicks referred to this too. Um, but it's important to understand that that term inoculation, as it was used for centuries before Jenner, was different from the vaccination that he developed. It, and, and inoculation is one of those areas in which Africa and Asia were well ahead of Europe. Europeans did not learn of variolation or inoculation until 1716. And when they did, they got their knowledge from Asia from, and from Africa. Um, one source, believe it or not, was an enslaved African named Onesimus, who belonged to the Puritan minister Cotton Mather in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, Onesimus was a Coromante. Um, he was probably from the central Sudan. 
And what happened was uh, enslaved people who had had smallpox were actually more valuable than enslaved people who had not had smallpox. So, uh, because, uh, and that was because they wouldn't contract smallpox and die. So Cotton Mather asked Onesimus, he said, you know, Onesimus, have you ever had smallpox? And Onesimus looked at him and said, yes and no. Mather records this in his diaries, right? Um, yes and no. And then Onesimus went on to describe this procedure that his father had put him through as a boy in West Africa, in which his father had cut an incision in his arm or his hand and implanted in that incision live pustular matter from smallpox. Bound it up. Little boy Onesimus had a, apparently a mild case of smallpox, garnered immunity, um, and lived on to adulthood with immunity to smallpox. The key is that unlike vaccination, which at least in its original form utilized what was called the cowpox virus, inoculation or variolation involves the deliberate infection of a susceptible individual with variola, with smallpox, usually through an incision in the hand or the arm. And when this is done, as you would predict, the patient comes down with smallpox. But inoculated smallpox is, in most cases, much less virulent than what people call the, the natural form of the disease. Survivors win lifelong immunity just as they do from natural smallpox, but mortality is much lower. But there's a catch. Individuals under inoculation do come down with smallpox, and they are therefore fully capable of infecting others with the disease. So unless it's implemented under strict quarantine, this practice is as likely to start an epidemic as to stop one. And for this and other reasons, it was extremely controversial in the English colonies. Now, the first signs of an impending explosion of smallpox came in 1775 during the early conflicts of the American Revolution in three different episodes, in the Siege of Boston, in the Siege of Quebec, and in the mobilization of Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian regiment in Virginia, smallpox reared its ugly head and established itself as a significant, if largely forgotten, player in the Revolutionary War. And I'm not going to have time to discuss the Ethiopian regiment here this evening, but I will discuss the outbreaks at Boston and Quebec, which pushed General Washington and his medical staff to make important policy decisions regarding smallpox control in the Continental Army. Now, it should come as no surprise that epidemic smallpox surfaced first in the revolutionary hotbed of Boston. With each new British action, with each colonial response, meetings convened, crowds gathered, messengers raced back and forth between the colonies. Isolated incidents of smallpox had occurred in towns around Boston through much of 1774. By January of 1775, smallpox had taken hold in Boston itself. And then after Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, this thing called the Siege of Boston got underway. And in the Siege of Boston, the British, the citizens of Boston, and the smallpox virus were all trapped in the city together. So if you're looking at this map, um, Boston looks nothing like this today, uh, you could see a little short-handled spoon sort of sticking out into Boston Harbor. Um, the Back Bay uh, area has been all filled in in the years since. Um, but in 1775, Boston stuck out into the harbor like this little short-handled spoon. And the city of Boston was in the bowl of that spoon. So during the siege, the Continental troops and militia surrounded that, that, the bowl of that spoon um, from the heights surrounding Boston Harbor. Now, the disease festered in Boston through the summer of 1775. George Washington was extremely anxious about it. You know, it well, almost, almost the very first orders he issued when he arrived at Boston were that any soldier showing, as he put it, the least symptoms of smallpox had to go into immediate 
quarantine. And I think it's worth pausing a minute to contemplate George Washington's personal experience with smallpox. In the year 1751, when he was 19 years old, George Washington had taken a trip to Barbados. Uh, and ironically, the reason for the trip to Barbados was to alleviate uh, his half brother Lawrence's persistent cough and congested lungs. Lawrence accompanied him to Barbados. And the hope was that the climate of Barbados would alleviate Lawrence's consumption or tuberculosis, the disease that ultimately killed him. Uh, what happens? They get to Barbados and George falls sick. He falls sick with smallpox. He retreats to his room for a month, doesn't pick up a pen to, to, to write in his journal. Um, he was an assiduous journalist. Um, he was very, very sick with smallpox. He lived um, with uh, uh, consequences that we are all familiar with. Uh, the point I want you to take away from that is that he knew from hard experience how smallpox could incapacitate his army um, if it got loose among his troops. At any rate, the American efforts at smallpox control uh, were successful through the summer, but in November of 1775, the disease surged in Boston. And then in the first week of December, four British deserters arrived at Washington's headquarters with frightening news. They said that the British general at Boston had deliberately infected several people, sent them out of the city to the American lines, as Washington put it, with a design to spread the smallpox among the troops. Now, at first, Washington could not believe it. But when smallpox broke out among some of the refugees that General William Howe allowed to leave Boston, Washington revised his skepticism and the Americans redoubled their efforts at smallpox control. In order to understand one of the dynamics in play here, um, you need to understand something called differential immunity. Um, in England at this, this time, especially in the major cities, smallpox was already endemic. It was constantly present in background. This meant that uh, People born in the city of London, for example, were likely to be exposed to smallpox when they were children. Um, they were therefore likely either to die from it as children or to reach adulthood with immunity. The upshot of this is that most, not all, but most British troops were immune to smallpox. Now, in the Americas, smallpox was not endemic. This meant that anybody born and raised in the Americas, didn't matter if you were Native American, African American, European American, if you were born and raised in the Americas, odds did not favor your having been exposed to smallpox as a child, and odds did favor your reaching adulthood with a vulnerability to the disease. So what this meant when it comes to the Revolutionary War is that British troops were likely to be invulnerable to smallpox and American troops were likely to be vulnerable. So for the American troops at Boston, the efforts at smallpox control paid off. A few individual incidents of smallpox occurred, but the disease did not spread among the American forces until after the British withdrew on March 17th, 1776. And then in the aftermath of the siege, people poured into Boston, essentially adding fuel to the fire that was already burning there. The Boston epidemic peaked in July of 1776, um, not surprisingly, and did not burn itself out until September. Now the news was considerably worse from a more northerly locale. In Canada, some 1900 American soldiers had besieged the British held city of Quebec over the winter of 1775 and 76, the very same winter that their comrades in arms besieged Boston to the south. This was actually an attempt to bring a 14th colony into the American Revolution. You know that that term the 13 colonies just rolls off our tongues today. 
if this campaign had succeeded, we would talk about the 14th, 14 colonies today. At any rate, they besiege Quebec over the winter of 1775 and 76, and by the spring of 76, they were in terrible shape. On May 1st, 1776, 900 of those 1900 American troops outside Quebec were sick, primarily with smallpox. Five days later, British reinforcements arrived and the Americans began the desperate retreat you see pictured here up the St. Lawrence River. And now even the semblance of quarantine disappeared. Men in the full throes of smallpox struggled through knee deep snow right alongside others who had never had the disease. My pock had become so sore and troublesome, a soldier named Lemuel Roberts, Roberts recalled, that my clothes stuck fast to my body, especially to my feet. And it became a severe trial to my fortitude to bear my disorder. Now within days, the fleeing soldiers had begun arriving at Sorel where the Richelieu River flows north into the St. Lawrence. And here in a cruel twist of fate, long sought American reinforcements arrived. These reinforcements were once again like adding fuel to a fire because the newcomers were almost all vulnerable to smallpox. From Sorel, the retreat continued southward until the army eventually paused at a little island called Ilo Noir near the north end of Lake Champlain. My eyes never before beheld such a scene, wrote John Lacey of Pennsylvania nor do I ever desire to see such another. The lice and maggots seemed to vie with each other, were creeping in, in millions over the victims. Now it took until September of 1776 for this Northern army also to cleanse itself of smallpox. Today, the damage remains hard to assess, but it's likely the smallpox carried away at least a thousand men during the Canadian campaign. Returning American soldiers caused havoc of their own, launching outbreaks in Pennsylvania and Connecticut that lasted well into 1777. Now by 1778, this disease that had been so explosive in the early years of the American Revolution, briefly faded away on the Eastern seaboard. Why? Well, in part, the momentary pause in smallpox was due to General Washington's decision to inoculate or variolate the Continental Army. And this decision reflected Washington's recognition that the revolution had brought about new circumstances, circumstances in which people and contagious disease, as well as ideas about liberty, circulated rapidly. In addition, Washington was concerned that his men might become the targets of British biological warfare. And his fears may well have been justified. He had already heard rumors of attempts to infect his army at Boston in 75 and in 1776. And then in 1777, a strange little book entitled Military Collections and Remarks was published in New York. New York was the, the British headquarters during the war. And it was written by a British officer named Robert Donkin. And in a telltale, in a, in, in a telling footnote in this book, Major Donkin actually proposed biological warfare. The text of the footnote read as follows. Dip arrows in matter of smallpox and twang them at the American rebels in order to inoculate them. This would sooner disband the stubborn, ignorant, enthusiastic savages than any other compulsive measures, such as their dread and fear of that disorder. Now, what's really interesting is what comes next. You may notice that the footnote appears blacked out in the slide that you're looking at. That footnote survives in only three known copies of the book. In all others, it has been carefully excised. When and by whom, we do not know. I would propose, however, 
that the fact that only three copies escaped to this excision suggests that it was done soon after publication, perhaps even at the request of British High Command. And I know it looks like somebody took a magic marker uh, on the slide that you're looking at. Actually, this is the, uh, a copy at the Clemens Library at the University of Michigan. And I asked them to photograph it with a piece of black paper behind the excised footnote, which is why it appears black. At any rate, quietly beginning in the spring of 1777 and continuing through the fo following winter, the American forces went through inoculation at West Point, at Morristown, Valley Forge, Alexandria, Dumfries, Fairfax. The procedure did not always go well for the, for the troops, but quarantine at least seems to have been secure. It did not uh, spread to surrounding populations. In the years that followed, Washington's forces were much less vulnerable than they had been, but others were not. And as the Revolutionary War moved southward, so too did smallpox. By mid-October 1779, the disease had erupted among the Creek Nation in central Alabama. And soon thereafter, variola also reached the cities of Charleston, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia. And in the two years that followed, it plagued the southern landscape and its, its residents right along with the war. Particularly hard hit were the enslaved African-Americans who fled to freedom behind British lines as Cornwallis's army marched through the South. Cornwallis's march to Yorktown may even have been marked by at least one attempt at biological warfare as the British turned their guns on desperately ill African-Americans to whom they had promised freedom and instead now apparently used them to spread smallpox behind American lines. Now, obviously these events were tragic, but they nevertheless paled by comparison to smallpox's ravages elsewhere on the continent at the same time. In 1779, the variola virus moved westward with a vengeance. Finally, now finding its way into this the truly vast susceptible populations it needed in order to thrive. In the West, uh, the Spanish mission system, trade, and once again, warfare joined together in transmitting the pestilence. In August of 1779, after an 18 year hiatus, smallpox erupted in Mexico City. It moved quickly, achieving official epidemic status on September 20th of 79, and by December 27th of 1779, the disease had afflicted more than 44,000 people in Mexico City. By the time it was over early in 1780, an estimated 18,000 people had died there. And even as it waned in the administrative hub of Mexico City, the pox began a devastating migration through other parts of New Spain. You know, Mexico City had such a huge population that it, it spread almost by centrifugal force. Moving southward, the epidemic eventually extended well into the South American continent. Moving northward, it, uh, it next struck Guanajuato, where it killed 10,000 people. And we could track the epidemic's passage through all those missions that you just saw on the map through the burial records of the Catholic Church, uh, which demarcate uh, is these surges in burials and sometimes uh, actually attribute them to smallpox as well. Along the west coast of Mexico and in Baja, California, smallpox traveled northward with the settlers who ultimately founded Los Angeles. These settlers crossed the Gulf of California they landed at Loreto on the, on, the, on the east coast of Baja, and despite carrying smallpox, they went into town and immediately it spread like lightning. And according to a Spanish missionary, the epidemic wreaked almost unbelievable havoc among the natives of Baja. Some threw themselves into the sea, he wrote. Others scorched themselves with firebrands, and the poor little children abandoned beside the dead died without help. The epidemic spread elsewhere from Mexico City as well. 
following the great royal road, the Camino Real, northward. By October 1780, it had reached San Antonio in central Texas. And within the next two months, it also arrived at Santa Fe and began to spread among the Pueblo peoples of New Mexico. And as you can see from this, this graph, the month of February 1781 was marked by terrible mortality. In that single month, the burials at 14 New Mexico missions totaled more than 1,000, which is up 55 times from an average of 19 per month in the previous few years. The smallpox epidemic killed more than 5,000 Christian natives in New Mexico. And if we had, uh, if we had statistics for non-Christian natives, uh, that number would be much, much larger. Now, neighboring Comanche peoples were also hit hard. In 1785, after this was all over, a group of Comanches told two visitors that smallpox had struck them and two thirds of them had died from which had followed the total destruction of their nature, nation. Comanches spread the disease too. They were horse traders. They sold Spanish horses from the Southern Plains of Texas and New Mexico to a more northerly people called Shoshones. For Shoshones and other northerly tribes, the consequences were terrible. And we know this because of the account given to a Canadian fur trader by an old native man called Sokamapi, who lived among the Blackfoot people. Sokamapi described how in the summer of 1781, Blackfeet had raided a Shoshone village. This is probably in Montana, or Southern Alberta, Saskatchewan. When the Blackfeet slashed through the Shoshone teepees, Sokomapi reported that all they found, as he put it, were the dead and the dying, each a mass of corruption. Soon thereafter, smallpox broke out among the Blackfeet. And before long, they communicated it to Cree and Assiniboine natives with whom they traded on the Canadian plains. On October 22, 1781, the first indigenous individual turned up with smallpox at a Hudson's Bay Company post on the North Saskatchewan River called Hudson House. It's marked on your map. Now bear in mind, this, is, this, this, this individual shows up on October 22nd, 1781. This is the very same time that smallpox is wreaking havoc among the thousands of African-Americans who have sought freedom behind British lines. This is the time of Yorktown, right? The British surrender in Yorktown was October 19th, 1781. By December, the sickness had reached Cumberland House, more than 120 miles downstream from Hudson House. And by June 1782, it had infected native peoples trading at York Factory, another 400 miles to the Northeast on the shores of Hudson Bay. So the trading posts of the Canadian Shield, like the missions of the Southwest, became deadly centers of contagion. The epidemic was equally devastating further south on the plains um, of, of North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, probably Minnesota as well. Um, along the, early, the Missouri River, agricultural nations, such as the Mandans and Hidatsas, lived in permanent, densely populated settlements. The epidemic may have reached them by way of Crow middlemen who ferried horses and goods to them from the Shoshones on the edge of the mountains. 23 years later, Lewis and Clark mapped the empty Mandan and Hidatsa villages wiped out by the epidemic. Now, as the epidemic raged among the Mandans and Hidatsas, a combined party of Crees, Assiniboines, and Ojibwas uh, from Canada attacked these villages. You know, everybody loved to attack the Mandans and Hidatsas because of their abundant supplies of horses, corn, and guns, and their permanent dwelling sites. You always knew where to find them. But attacking these people in 1781 had deadly consequences. The attackers carried smallpox home to Lake Winnipeg, where it decimated their village. 
Lakota people, sometimes called Sioux by their enemies, also appear to have picked up smallpox through their attacks on Mandans and Hidatsas. We know this because of archaeological evidence, but we also know this because Lakota winter counts, uh, a way of uh, keeping a track of Lakota history and, and sort of an indigenous um, historic calendar, winter counts indicate that the tribe suffered from smallpox over two successive years. Now, recorded eyewitness accounts of the pestilence end at Hudson Bay and the Northern Plains, but the epidemic did not. It also struck the Northwest Coast, which is where we started out this evening. This is where George Vancouver and others observed its depopulating effects after the fact. The question is how it got there. We have no eyewitness accounts of the epidemic on the Northwest Coast. But there were, in fact, several possible routes by which smallpox could have reached the Northwest Coast in the late 1770s or early 1780s. Now, one possibility is that the source was Russian. By the late 1700s, Russians sailing east from Kamchatka had developed a very active, and I will add brutal, trade with the natives of the Alaskan coast and the Aleutian Islands. And smallpox had wreaked havoc across Siberia and on the Kamchatka Peninsula in 1768. In my view, this is the least likely scenario, among other reasons, because the timing is too early. And a second possibility is that the virus was carried to the northwest coast by one of several European voyages to the region in this period, possibly one of the Spanish voyages um, departing from San Blas, where we know smallpox was raging. But here again, the evidence is less than convincing. We have no accounts of smallpox on shipboard. So what's most likely, I think, is that the smallpox came from inland Shoshone peoples in 1781 or 1782, probably by way of the Columbia River. Your know, Northwest Coast natives had a robust trade inland. Archaeologists have found seashells from the Pacific in Idaho, in the heart of Shoshone country even at the Mandan and Hidatsa villages in North Dakota. So I believe Shoshones probably hold the key to explaining the epidemic spread, not just on the Northern Plains, but also by way of the Snake and Columbia Rivers to the Northwest Coast. Okay, so we have connected a lot of dots. It's probably not the right metaphor to use, um, but what, what was the impact of this great wave of pestilence? Well, the implications were as varied as the regions that smallpox struck. In the East, smallpox was one of several things that combined to dash the dreams and aspirations of freedom-loving African-Americans during the Revolutionary War. And at the same time, smallpox control was an essential component of the American victory in the Revolution. You know, Washington's order to, orders to inoculate his troops was one of his most important decisions of the war keeping the infection at bay. In the Southwest, at the most visible level, the impact was twofold. First of all, the disease weakened the Comanche people enough that they established a temporary peace with the Spaniards. In addition, the precipitous population decline forced Spanish officials in New Mexico to contract the mission system on the Northern frontier. Many missions were eliminated entirely. In Canada, the fur trade collapsed. At York Factory, which was the Hudson Bay Company's largest post, the trade dropped from roughly 26,000 made beaver, that was the way of keeping their account books, dropped from 26,000 made beaver in 1781 to roughly 13,000 made beaver the next year. And statistics like that indicate that the effects of the epidemic reverberated widely. It was devastating to native peoples, but by the same token, it was a relief to the beaver who felt less hunting pressure. On the Northern Plains, the agricultural Mandans and Hidatsas with those densely populated Earth Lodge villages suffered many more losses than their nomadic Lakota enemies did. And Lakotas soon overran them and became the dominant tribe of the Northern Plains 
that westward moving Anglo-Americans would encounter in the 19th century. Finally, and this is related to what I just said, the events I've just described indicate that by the time these Anglo-Americans arrived in what we think of as the pristine West, it was not pristine at all. Thank you, and let me stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to take some questions. Let's see. All right. Here I am, back moderator. Thank you very much for that presentation. Fascinating and scary, uh, particularly since it's impossible not to think of current events and thinking about smallpox. Um, I have a question, but uh, I, I see some questions have popped up that I think I'd rather ask first, but I, I just need to make a comment uh, about those of us of a certain age who have smallpox scars in our arms. Um, I had the opportunity to interview uh, Dr. D.A. Henderson before he died, who uh, uh, led the team that eradicated smallpox from the planet. And I uh, expressed amazement to him that his resume could legitimately put somewhere on a bullet point, eliminated major world disease. Uh, not many people can claim to do that. But uh, I said, I made the remark about younger people not being uh, vaccinated and those of us who are older have those scars to testify to our lifelong immunity. And he said, ah, it's not lifelong. And I said, okay. He said that vaccination is probably solid for about 15 to 17 years. And after that, who knows? Yeah. For those of you listening who had those smallpox scars, don't get a false sense of security if this disease should pop up again. All right, um, I'm going to get to the questions that have been posed by some of the listeners. And I'm gonna combine the first two questions in, into one. Uh, one question is, do we know where in the world smallpox originated? And the other question, which is very related, if I recall, there was some debate about how old smallpox is. What is the latest research on that? Do you have a comment? Gosh, well, I'm trying to remember what the latest research, research shows. I know they are doing a DNA research on smallpox. Um, we we have, have a pretty good idea that smallpox may have afflicted ancient Egypt. Um, it's not clear based on ancient DNA found in Europe. So, we're, you know, it goes back at least 3,000 years or so, um, but it's not it's not clear based on ancient DNA in in Europe that uh, smallpox was always as virulent as what I talked about today. Um, there's some indication that uh, an earlier form of the virus may have been somewhat less virulent. Um, at any rate, how old is it? Uh, my answer is that I do not know. It surely uh, came from other primates, uh, probably you know from monkeypox or some other orthopox virus circulating among primates. Um, but uh, I would say there may be evidence from China that goes back further than um, ancient Egypt. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Hicks, you may have some thoughts about it. You've been looking, looking at that material more recently than I have. I, I can't uh, pull it all into my head at the moment, but my colleagues at the ancient uh, DNA center at McMaster are among leading researchers uh, looking at the DNA lineage of smallpox. They came out with a startling paper a few years ago to point out that all the smallpox that we know of um, really does not exist beyond about five centuries ago. And so uh, the possible appearance of it in Egypt, and it's much cited, there's a, 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 a mummy of an Egyptian pharaoh who seems right. smallpox pustules and so forth. Whether that is the same smallpox or not, uh, we don't know. As I pointed out earlier, there's a huge spectrum here and there are a lot of unknowns and even, you know, this vaccinia is part of that equation. Where did it come from? How did it evolve? And uh, as you point out, um, Dr. Fenn, the crossover between animals and people is part of the story and it makes it more very, very difficult. Uh, things go from animals to people and even people to animals. Yeah. And as we see that with COVID too, as a matter of fact. So unfortunately, I can't, uh, disambiguate that question uh, much, but uh, I'd say watch the space because the DNA research mm -hmm. is quite promising. And as year by year uh, passes, the ability of 
researchers to rescue disaggregated DNA fragments and make something of them is getting more and more sophisticated. So we may learn more in the future. Uh, the next question is a very interesting one that I wanted to raise in a slightly different form. The laws on inoculation varied from one colony to another. In your research, have you seen any evidence for state governments changing their laws on inoculation as a result of the wartime epidemic? And uh, it seems to me, and maybe it's from your book, uh, at the time that George Washington is making those very insightful decisions at the Siege of Boston, isn't it against the law in Massachusetts at that moment to get vaccinated? Well, to get inoculated. Inoculated, I'm sorry. Yeah, variolated. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, and that's a great question. Yes, um, many, especially urban areas, tended to uh, ban inoculation until smallpox erupted. And then they would lift the ban so that people could undergo inoculation. One exception to this, you'll be interested to know, was the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was notorious for having no inoculation laws or bans whatsoever. And it was also kind of notorious for being a, a nest, if you will, of contagious smallpox. So one of the things Washington did before he made his decision to inoculate the troops was, especially as, as vulnerable troops marched northward from the south, he issued orders that they were to avoid Philadelphia at all costs in order for them to avoid contracting smallpox. So yes, most cities um, did have bans on smallpox inoculation because they were afraid it would get out and circulate in the natural way. Um, but then they would lift those bans when an epidemic erupted. Good question. Yes, I, I'd like to add a small piece to that. And mostly what the research I've done is mostly concentrated around the Civil War era. There was no absolute consistency in how uh, inoculations were performed, how vaccinations were performed. And uh, one of the challenges to any doctor in considering whether they even had a smallpox case, you might have to wait days to be certain of your diagnosis that that is exactly what's going on. And it uh, was fairly common and it's in the medical textbooks of the 19th century. You might mistake it for measles at the outset. And so smallpox classified as an eruptive skin disease because of course that's what you see. But initially it's red spots and then it progresses to worse things. Yeah. Uh, so that complicates the problem. Uh, before we go to the next question, uh, to further complicate this, you've shown several maps in your presentation. And I, and I wanted to highlight that you make it look easy to construct those pathways and to work out the chronologies, but it's not. And uh, maybe you'd comment a bit on your own research, which I think parallels contract tracing uh, uh, techniques. You use some computer software to kind of work out all of these reports from primary sources to try to get a chronological timeline, to look at how uh, people here are influencing people there. You care to comment on how you did that? Well, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, I was doing contact tracing. I will say that I, I actually entertained the, the fantasy of going into the EPI service if I didn't get a, an academic uh, history job. Um, needless to say, I did. So, so here I am today. So what I did was uh, I, I, I was an early adopter of GIS. And I had this elaborate system where every note that I took, where I was able to, to, to identify a location for an outbreak, I entered it into the GIS. Um, and that enabled, I transformed my research really because it enabled me to see the epidemic move. You know, you could attach a graduated color scheme to those maps. I mean, you haven't seen all the maps, but you could attach, attach a graduated color scheme to individual dots. And in fact, you could see my, all of my note cards. If you go to ehistory.org at the University of Georgia, um, a, a wonderful historian there named Claudio Sound has uh, digitized all, all my note cards and you can click on individual outbreaks and find all my notes for those outbreaks. And my hope is that people would take that research and run with it, correct it, build on it, and so on. Now, there is a way in which 
the maps that I showed you this evening, the big continental map, is also deceiving. Because you might have noticed there's this big hole sort of in the Midwest, the Ohio country. I couldn't find any evidence there. But absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So it's a hole on the map. But I do not know that those areas were free of smallpox. Um, it's just one of the challenges of doing research of this kind in early records, you know, doing, especially out West, doing native history um, with the, uh, uh, you know, very limited sources. Yeah. Uh, with the spread of smallpox, this is another question from a listener. With the spread of smallpox throughout the Indian nations, were there any attempts to inoculate to reduce the spread? There were attempts to actually vaccinate to reduce the spread. I am not aware of attempts to inoculate Native peoples en masse. Um, there is a historian at Utah State University named Seth Archer, who is launching a project to investigate that question and ways in which Native peoples um, defended themselves against the disease. Now, there were vaccination campaigns um, in the West that uh, were implemented along the Missouri River in, I want to say, 1828. I might have the, the, the year wrong. Um, and, so, and what this did was confer immunity to many native tribes that were then less affected by another epidemic that, it, that swept the West in 1837 and 1838. Um, so there were some attempts at immunizing native peoples. Lewis and Clark, believe it or not, actually um, took lymph material, uh, you know, vac vaccine with them. Uh, and it turned out to be inert when they tried to use it. So they could not vaccinate native peoples. Yes, and that's worth a, a footnote that you could follow these techniques and it doesn't necessarily guarantee success. Yeah. Uh, one other question I think related to uh, uh, some of the stats that you had towards the latter part. What caused the significant spike in Mexico in one month? You know, this is something we're learning about today. Um, you know, smallpox arrived in New Mexico it probably spread very slowly at first. Um, we don't have uh, written accounts, good written accounts of the way it spread or the you know particular um, stories about it. But it probably you know, circulated slowly at first, and people didn't realize they were getting infected, uh, and then suddenly you see the explosion um, as contacts um, circulate. I, your screen has locked up here. I don't know if it's ah. at my end or yours. Okay. Okay. I, you were I can hear you. I can hear screen, you. But, but uh, okay. your, your image just sort of jumps ahead every so many seconds, but you can hear. Yep. I hear you. Okay. Um, we had another question that brings it into COVID. Um, how optimistic are you regarding the effectiveness of the COVID vaccine? I, I'm on. Are you, are you able to hear me? Because are you, you're, you sort of froze there. I don't know what happened to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you still there? Okay, I will attempt to answer that question, at least from my own perspective. Uh, I'm optimistic. Um, about uh, creating a vaccine. Uh, obviously, there are multiple teams at work that are communicating with one another about how to do this. And uh, <clears throat> I haven't followed it technically. I don't have that expertise anyway. But uh, I'm optimistic that some protection, some level of uh, protection will be afforded. And I'm not expecting this to be a vaccine that is going to be reliable over a long period of time. Um, and it may be possible that 
getting a vaccination once may necessitate getting a vaccination again a short time later. Um, I think we should be prepared for all kinds of possibilities, but I don't think I could go any further than that in answering the question. Elizabeth, are you back? Or let me see if there are more questions. Molly, I see you, but I don't know what happened to Elizabeth. No. I'm afraid, I'm afraid maybe we lost her somehow. Colorado's okay. too far for Zoom, perhaps. <laughs> okay. I think uh, while we've been... Uh, all right. Uh, the last uh, question to, to pop up is not a question, but it's a comment. This is absolutely, absolutely fabulous. My favorite speaker series event so far. Oh. Great. So very much appreciate that. I maybe it's time since it's about ten after eight that we uh, uh, round this off and uh, um, hope that Elizabeth isn't cursing the system at the moment. But uh, I want to thank her for a fine presentation, and I I really encourage you to read her book. It's a page turner, but over to you, Molly. All right, well, I, I also wanna thank Elizabeth and I wanna thank you too, Robert. It was an honor to have both of you. You have such a wealth of really interesting knowledge to share with us. So thank you very much, both of you. A few other thanks, all the volunteers who made all these speaker events possible, thank you. Thank you to our sponsor, the Sharon H. and Bruce A. Bakke Foundation. We could not do this without you. Thank you all for participating in the discussion tonight and for buying a ticket. You're helping the Alliance continue. And I'd like to make a plug for our next speaker series on January 5th. It is Foul Bodies, Cleanliness in Early America, Sanitation and Social Strife in the Continental Army. And it's presented by Kathleen Brown, who is the David Boys Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. And lastly, again, I wanna thank all of the Valley Forge Park Alliance members for your wonderful support of the Alliance. You truly make our mission possible every day. And with that, I wish you all a very good night from Valley Forge and we will see you in the new year. Good night.